Welcome to the Onco PT Podcast, where you'll learn from oncology experts, practitioners, and patients to help you on your journey to become a confident and competent Onco PT. Here's your host, Elise Contu. Hey, Onco PT, and welcome to this episode of the Onco PT Podcast. It has been a minute since we've done a solo episode, and a lot has happened since then. Um, first and foremost, it's summer, which is, I think I say this with every season, but I do think summer is probably one of my favorites. I think autumn might be the official favorite, but summer holds such a special place in my heart. And let me explain why. So in addition to all of the normal summer things that we tend to enjoy as kids, I actually swam competitively in starting in elementary school, middle school, and then in high school. And so during middle school and elementary school, it was really just summer league. And then once I got to high school, I actually did it like school year round um, with the high school team. But anyways, this is about the time when swim practice would start for the summer season. And while I didn't enjoy the early mornings that we had to get up for and be in the pool by 530, there was so much more to that that made it such a special time in my life and something that I look very fondly upon. There were lots of friends. There was fun. There was, you know, a bit of competition with it. There was a lot. And it's it's so fun to look back on it now. And so I was actually reflecting on this the other day of just like, oh my gosh, it's almost swim season. Like, how cool is that? Da, 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 da. Also, sidebar, the Olympics are this summer and I am a fanatic for the Olympics, especially the Summer Olympics. A, because they have swimming. Also, they have gymnastics and they just have so many other cool things that like... I get overly emotional when I think about them, so I'm going to stop right here. But, like, this is such a good time. Like, summer is here, and it's great. And it also happens to be, with all of this colliding, it also happens to be the official start of case report season. Now, I know you might be thinking, Elise, how in the world do case reports and summer swim league and now the Olympics, the Olympics don't really come in here. But how do case reports and swim season really come together. Well, today's theme for the episode is dive in. And what this really means is when it came to swim practice, I'm going to paint you a picture. So practice during the summer started at 5.30 a.m., as in you jump in the pool at 5.30 or before to get started with the workout. So you get in the pool and the coach really, ha you know, normally had some kind of a warm up written. This is what you're going to start with to start warming up your body. Now, you're probably very familiar with exercise and warm ups, the importance of that. We still have to do that in swimming. And so you would get in, you would start the warm up set, and then there would usually be a little more, you know, a few more sets that we would do, like swim exercises, if you will, and then eventually the main set, and then you'd work out really, really hard during the main set, and then eventually there would be some kind of a cool down, and then practice would be done at 7 a.m. So even in Texas, even in Texas, the water in the mornings, when you'd first jump in, it's a little cool, right? It has to do with the difference between the temperature of the air, the temperature of the water. You're just waking up, and there's nothing worse than cold water hitting the small of your back, Anyways, so all this to say, the water is not pleasant when you first get in. It's just not. And so there's two ways that people tend to get in the pool to start swim practice. And this is held true. So in addition to my own swimming, like swimmer experience, I also coached swimming with this team for many years. And I have coached all the way from two-year-olds all the way through adulthood. And literally, this holds true for every age group of swimmers that I've ever coached. There's two ways that people jump in the pool or they get in the pool to start the warm up, right? So there's the inchers, we're going to call them, where they slowly get into the pool, one body part at a time. So they start by maybe sitting on the edge of the pool and they dip their toes in. And it's usually accompanied by a whoo because it is cold. And then they'll gradually get the rest of their feet in, their ankles, their legs, up to their knees, and then the rest of their legs. And then, ooh, when that water hits the small of your back, it's awful. Okay, it's awful. There's no getting around it. And eventually, once they finally get their shoulders below the water, they duck their head under, and then they push off the wall, and they usually start swimming in the warm-up. 
Okay. So th that category we're going to call our inchers. They inch into the water. On the other hand, we have our divers or our jumpers. We're going to call them divers for simplicity's sake here. So uh, the inchers are still sitting on the sidelines, still sitting on the side of the pool. The divers are actually going to jump in the pool because they know it is going to suck. It is going to suck. It is going to be cold when that cold water hits the small of your back. Again, unless you have done this, I don't know how else to describe this. <laughs> But they are going to jump in and frankly, just get the suck over with as fast as possible. Because while the jumping in doesn't solve the cold water issue, what that then allows them to do is jump in and then start swimming the warm up. Now, you and I know this because we're skilled physical therapists, but the warm up is literally designed to warm up your muscles. The water's going to suck either way. No matter how you get in the pool, it's still bites when you first get in the water. But what the divers are doing is they are jumping in, they are kind of embracing the suck, or at least trying to get it over with as fast as possible so that they can start with the warm up and get that ugh, cold water feeling over. So what they're doing while the inchers are still on the side of the pool, again, gradually getting their body parts in the pool, the divers are already in the water and they're already on their second lap of the warm up, maybe even beyond, depending on how long the incher takes to get in the pool. So at this point, we have our two groups of swimmers. They need to start the workout. They need to start the warm up. The warm up is the first part of the workout, right? And so by the time that the divers have finished the warm up, sometimes the inchers are just now getting in the pool or they're just starting on the warm up. And again, I have seen this both as a swimmer and as a swim coach all age groups. And while this doesn't seem like a big difference immediately, right? What's a few laps? It was just the warm up, not a big deal. We've still got the whole workout ahead of us. By the time that the insure is still getting used to the water, the diver's already ready. They're already warmed up. They're already acclimate, acclimated or at least somewhat accustomed to the water. Their muscles are warmed up, they're loose, they're feeling really mobile, and they're ready to get started. And so what happens in this case is that the insure is just starting on the warm-up. Maybe they're going to finish the warm-up and they're just going to be behind for the rest of practice. Okay, sometimes that happens. But maybe the insure decides to cut their warm-up short in an effort to try to get back on pace with the rest of the swim team in the water, right? Either way they look at it, they're still going to be behind for the entire workout, for the entire hour and a half that we would be in practice. And they cut corners, and this isn't like, oh, they're bad people, but just hear me out with this metaphor here. They're cutting down the amount of laps that they are swimming, which means that they are getting fewer repetitions, fewer strokes in per workout compared to our, our jumpers and divers, right? And again, maybe that's they are going to cut the warm up short to try and catch up with everybody. Or what also happened, this was something that I also saw, is that the inchers are going to stay on track with the entire workout. Like they're gonna do every single lap, but they're going to finish so much later and so much behind the divers. Because by the time that that hour and a half workout is done, the divers are done, right? They've done all the laps. They've done all the repetitions. They have put in the work. They have done the effort. It's time for them to get up and go. But the injures, again, maybe they're getting out with them because they cut the workout short or they're still in the pool finishing. Regardless of what path the insure takes, they still did not put in the number of repetitions and the laps and the work that happens with every single lap that you are doing in the pool. Now, one workout, one day a week, maybe doesn't mean that much. But over the course of a week, over the course of a month, over the course of the two months that our summer season was, it does add up. Two potentially hundreds, if not thousands, truly, of, you know, like difference between the number of laps 
and strokes and kicks and breath holding and all the other things that go into swimming, that difference adds up very quickly over time. And so it's very apparent to see where people kind of fall when it comes to how they looked at the beginning of the season and how they look at the end of season as far as how well are they swimming? What are their swim times like, right? So in swimming, the goal is to, you know, be as fast as possible. Who's faster? Who's putting in that work? And again, while it doesn't make, while it doesn't seem like that big of a difference when we first start thinking about this metaphor, when we think about one swim practice, one warm up in one swim practice, but over time that compounds. And this is why this is such a big deal. When I was first reflecting on the summer, and again, looking fondly back on all those years, all those hours of spending time in the pool for summer league swim practice, this wasn't necessarily where I was going, but it was really interesting to see kind of how just everything in my life so far has led me to this moment. And like swim was such a huge part of my identity for so long. And it's really fun to be like, huh, how interesting is that, that now in my work as an oncology physical therapist, I'm able to draw parallels from my own experience with summer league, which is so fun to me. And I think my coach, <laughs> my, I think my swim coach would be really excited by that. But the reason I bring this up is that there is a lesson in all of this, right? We're not just talking about Elise rambling on about, oh my God, swim practice. The lesson behind all of this is that it is going to suck when you first get started period. Okay. This is unavoidable. This is inevitable. Anytime we are learning to do something new or we are trying to level up in our, in our skill, in our experience, in our knowledge, in our anything that we do, it is going to be uncomfortable. It is going to be challenging. It is going to be difficult. But you can either get through the suck like jump in and just know that the suck is going to be there and you're going to move through it as efficiently, as effectively as possible. Or you can delay the inevitable. That would be our intra group, right? Get the toes in and then get the foot in and then get the leg in, et cetera, et cetera, right? It is going to suck. And so my encouragement to you would be dive in and get started already and maybe not embrace the suck, but kind of embrace the suck, especially when we're newer in OncoPT or again, you're trying to get to that next level of what OncoPT is for you and the work that you're doing. It is going to be hard. It is going to be challenging. You are going to feel stuck and frustrated and maybe mad and alone, lost, confused, like all, all the feelings unsure of how to get through what you're going through right now. How in the world are you supposed to do this? How in the world am I supposed to help my patient with blah, 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 feel better when I don't even know what this means, right? This is unavoidable. This is part of being an Onco PT because there's so much that you learn that we learn in such a short period of time and how much more we still have to learn to be the best possible onco PT for our patients, right? But when you spend time purposely, intentionally in the suck, in our metaphor that we're talking about swimming here, that would be in the cold water, right? When that cold water hits ooh, the small of your back, when you spend time here in the suck, in the challenges, in the, the trenches, if you will, you learn why things are hard. Like, why does it feel hard? What makes them difficult? Why am I having this, this challenge as I'm trying to work through this? How to fix things? How to make them less challenging? How to make that cold water suck a little less? Or maybe for a shorter period of time. Again, if I jump in, then I can just get it over with once I finish that warm up. You learn when you're in the trenches, when you're in that cold water, etc. You learn how to not get out of those things, you learn how to move through those things. You learn how to move through the challenges, through the difficulties that come with managing this very wonderful but medically dynamic and complicated patient population. We're not learning how to get out of it. We're learning how to navigate through that. 
And the reason that this is so important, and this is something you have likely already seen in your career thus far as a PT, or maybe, you know, from school, if you remember that, the more you do something, the better you get at recognizing characteristics or traits or patterns about this. And pattern recognition comes from doing more repetitions. Okay. So again, we're coming back to our swimming analogy here, if you will. In swimming, the more laps you do, the more strokes that you take, the more kicks that you do, the longer you hold your breath, da, 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 the better you get at each of those things. And together, the better you get at swimming. And this looks like, again, maybe you're increasing the amount of time that you're holding your breath underwater, that you're holding the streamline position um, in the in the Olympics, if you don't know what I'm talking about. When the swimmers push off the wall, they're trying to be as aerodynamic in the water as possible. And so that's what we're talking about here. The more, again, the more kicks you do, the more pulls you do with the pull buoy, et cetera, et cetera. All of those, the better you get at each of those individual things. And that contributes to getting better at swimming overall. The same happens in OncoPT. The more evaluations that you get through, and let's be clear, the more evaluations you struggle through at the beginning, because everybody does. Oh my God, I remember my first evals. They were awful. You know, the more time that you spend reading about certain conditions, about, you know, learning about the different side effects of the different cancer treatments, what are these impairments, what actually works to treat blah, blah impairment, the more time you spend with this and in this, the easier time you're going to have moving through it. But you don't get there without putting in the repetitions first, such as doing the laps, swimming the yards, swimming the meters, whatever your unit of measure is, and just keeping moving through it. Second thing I want you to take away from this is that repetitions are not the only thing that make for an expert. Reflection and intention are crucial for quality repetitions. So here's where this all ties into a PT for me. So swimming is actually where I sustained a pretty significant injury when I was a sophomore in high school. And it all came down to technique. I kid you not. Listen, if you want to nerd out about swim technique with me sometime, um, find me on Instagram. You can DM me. We can chat all day about it. But there is a specific technique to each swim stroke or different variations on that that are where we use our muscles most efficiently. Swimming is definitely an overhead athlete sport. But one thing that especially like maybe younger or less experienced swimmers don't realize is that it's not actually like, yes, our shoulders move, but the muscles that really need to be driving each stroke, instead of being our like flimsy little rotator cuff muscles, they need to be our strong, big muscles, right? Our foundation in our chest and in our back, right? But unless you are putting in quality effort quality repetitions with good technique, bad things can happen, okay? And I don't mean like, oh my God, the sky is falling, but things can happen that can make your your path much more challenging. And for me, that was actually two shoulder injuries. Um, and then I ended up with all kinds of other little things along the way. I'm fine now, y'all. Like, I'm good to go. No, like, no issues. I had a great PT who helped me through all of that. But that was definitely a detour in my path to becoming a better swimmer. So unless you're doing repetitions with purpose, with intention to have good quality technique, you are not guaranteed that ending, whatever that end goal is. You have to be purposeful, intentional, and good quality repetitions with each of the things you're doing because swimming endlessly without thought or without reflection on what am I doing? Why am I doing is a quick path to injury, as I just mentioned previously. When you intentionally, purposefully, purposely reflect on the repetitions, and again, in swimming, that would be the strokes you're taking, you can start to even develop the ability to know, hmm, I need to make an adjustment here. Something doesn't feel right. And what's cool here is that you can even start in swimming and in Onco PT, you can start to determine, hmm, this is not, 
this isn't right. I need to make an adjustment because again, in swimming, maybe I'm going to hurt myself. Maybe I'm going to injure my shoulder. In Onco PT, it's, I could be more effective here. I don't actually have to do that. Oh, I should be actually using this approach instead of this, what I was doing previously, right? So one of the things, you know, one of the examples I came up with for Onco PT instead of swimming for this particular metaphor is I like to incorporate a lot of resistance training for my patients after they've gone through cancer treatment, right? We know this is beneficial for a variety of reasons. And because of the patient population I tend to work with, strength definitely tends to be an issue. So I've got a pretty good flow. I've got a pretty good plan. I'm like, okay, this is what I do. This is what I like to start with based on what my patient's dealing with. Like, I feel very comfortable with that. But when I started working with patients who were a little more layered, a little more complicated, who had bony metastases, for example, that was, that was like, oh no, I don't know what to do here. I'm not really sure what to do. And if I had moved forward without reflecting, without thinking of, oh, this person has a bony metastasis here. I need to be careful with X, Y, Z. Instead, just plowing through with this, like we're going to do resistance training. Um, I, I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to care. I'm not going to even acknowledge the bony metastasis. Um, there was something that could have happened really bad, right? It could have really injured that patient. And so while this was something I was very unfamiliar with, very uncomfortable with at first, and it took me a lot longer to really sit with and reason on, how can I change this? How can I make this better? Da, 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 da. Now that I've put in the repetitions that I have seen multiple patients over a period of time who have bony metastases, I feel very confident in my ability to prescribe appropriate interventions that are still going to help improve their strength without potentially overtaxing them and injuring them along the way. But I did not learn how to do this until I did it a bunch of times and I reflected on what I was doing, why I was doing what I was doing, why I was not doing what I was not doing, example. So anyways, a lot of this, all this to sum up and say, you have to think back, you have to reflect on what you've done. You can't just put in a lot of repetitions and hope that it sticks and hopes that, you know, hope that you get better. You have to be very considerate, intentional, and purposeful when you're reflecting on all of this, if you're ever going to get better with treating your patients who have bony metastases, for example, or working with your patient who has, you know, chest and breast lymphedema, any number of these things, right? Now, the last lesson that I want to leave you with that has to do with this whole, you know, swimming experience, etc. The faster you move through the suck with intention and reflection, the sooner you get to go home. Now, this does work for Onco PT, but I want you to think about what happens also at the end of the swim workout. So at the end of the swim workout, you are tired, right? Um, if you were on our swim team, you were up at the butt crack of dawn so that you could be at practice that started at 5.30 a.m., which was brutal. You probably didn't sleep as much as you wanted to. So when you finished the workout, that meant that you could go home you know, cause it's summertime, right? So I could go home and take a nap or I could go and hang out with my friends or I could go and eat. That was my favorite thing because whew, you burn a lot of calories when you're swimming, etc. But whatever that end goal was at the end of the workout, when you finished, you could go do that thing. And the faster you moved through the workout with high quality reps, the sooner you got to leave and go do something else that you wanted to do that was more enjoyable, that was maybe less miserable than swim practice was sometime. Now, I do want to mention, this is not a race pace that, oh, if I just get all the yards in, coach will let me go home. No, we if we like definitely had to redo sets of, you know, exercises or laps or whatever sometimes because coach wasn't happy with how we did things. That wasn't very common, but like that is a thing. And the same thing goes for Onco PT. If you do a trash job because you're trying to just get through stuff really quickly, you're probably going to have to do it again. Maybe not right then and there, but later on down the road, it's going to come back to bite you in the butt. Same thing here with swimming. The faster you move through the workout with intention and high quality reps, the faster you get to go home. There are going to be long days in Onco PT, especially 
at the beginning. Again, it's kind of one of those things that's in a, unavoidable. It's inevitable. But you're not going to have long days forever. You shouldn't have long days forever. And to move through the long days, you have to reflect intentionally. And this means reviewing patient interactions from maybe that day, maybe that week, but also maybe even further back. You know, I still have patient cases that kind of float to my mind every so often that I think, hmm, you know, I just read this article. That would have been really helpful to implement with that patient. I wish I had done that differently. Now I know, right? Now I know, and I'm going to do it differently with the next person that I counter with XYZ diagnosis and impairments, right? And this means asking, again, what you would change or adapt now that you have more information. This is not a guilt thing, okay? I want to be abundantly clear. This is not for you to feel guilty about what you did when you didn't have that information, that experience. But now that you do have that information and experience, what would you change to have a better outcome for you and that patient? right? And then you implement that tomorrow, right? Next time you see a patient, you're going to say, oh, I'm going to do this instead of what I did last time. You're going to reassess and then you're going to continue to refine as you go. And when you're able to implement this kind of a process of, oh, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to tweak as I go because I'm going to get better results doing this. You're able to move through your day more easily. And that means that you get to finish your work day sooner. And who doesn't love that? This is especially important because if you're in the Northern Hemisphere like me, summer is here. Summer is here. And I know that you have big plans with your family, with your friends. You want to get out and go do stuff. And I want that for you too. And the best way that I know, the fastest way to accelerate, to speed time up, to condense time and condense the suck experience is by implementing these three lessons that I've talked about today. So number one, pattern recognition comes from more repetitions. Repetitions aren't the only thing that make you an expert. Reflection and intention are crucial for quality repetitions. And the faster you move through the suck with intention and reflection, the faster you get to go home or insert benefit here, right? And one of the biggest ways that I was able to really condense time through the suck, the suck still happened, the suck, the suck was still there. But one of the ways that was most impactful for me to really kind of take a step back from the day to day of, I have a full day of patient cases, I've got documentation out the wazoo, I've got these silly meetings that I have to go to and more paperwork, blah, 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 blah. The way I was able to get through the patient care side of things so that I could show up more fully and more as an expert for my patients was actually by reflecting on patient cases like this. And I have the one that probably made the most difference for me here. I'm going to give you just a little information, then we're going to move on from this. So several years ago, I was treating a patient who was in his mid sixties. He was diagnosed with multiple myeloma and he had a lot going on. He had some, he had actually a few pathologic fractures that precipitated his multiple myeloma diagnosis. He was very deconditioned from an extended hospital stay and then subsequent sedentary lifestyle that was because of his pathologic fractures secondary to the multiple myeloma. All this to say, when he came in to see me, the PT, he had a lot going on. But what was most important to him is that he felt prepared for his upcoming hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Because he knew as hard as things were happening right then and there, and they were going to continue to be hard, that was going to be the hardest part of his treatment. And he wanted to feel physically, emotionally, mentally ready for that process. And so that's a big part of what we worked on together. He was actually my very first patient that I saw going in to a transplant. I've seen a few patients at that time after they had gone through the transplant, but never beforehand and never someone who I could effectively like, we kind of put in this like prehab protocol. Was it true prehab? No, because he was already going through like chemotherapy and whatnot, but we did like a prehab for hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And that was really cool. And there were a lot of lessons learned during this process he made a ton of progress. It was amazing. He eventually reached his functional goals. He came out on the other side of hematopoietic stem cell transplant 
great. It was awesome. But there were also some bumps along the road. There were also some lessons learned. Um, he had a few adverse effects. Unfortunately, this patient had a DVT at one point. He was then put on a no exercise, you know, like an activity hold for a bit. Um, he actually, along the way, also developed a new pathologic fracture, and that was something we had to work around. And it was only by looking back at these bumps, these issues, these challenges we had along the way, you know, sometimes they were speed bumps, sometimes they were straight up like construction roadblocks. But it was only by reflecting on these that I was able to change what I was doing and then go back and implement it better for the patient on the other side of that. And not just for that patient, but for my future patients, the patients I've been treating since him and will continue to treat, that those lessons I've learned, I can now take and implement and say, mm, I learned that. I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to do it you know, this other way or, you know. I bet this patient would benefit from a similar approach that I took with this patient, et cetera. And so it was looking at what I did, why I did those things, why I didn't do the things that I didn't do, et cetera, and what I would change looking back on it that really helped me start to think a little bigger, a little more like an expert or an emerging expert within oncology, physical therapy, and within cancer rehab. And this reflection process really set me on the path to becoming the clinician I am today. And that's really cool to think about. That's really exciting. And it's really fun to look back on that patient case and know that this was such a formative experience for me that has now not only led me to where I am, but has also opened up a lot of opportunities because of the learning and the reflection and the growth that I've done along the way. And all this to say, this is why I'm such a proponent of case report writing, because it forces you to do this. Everything we've been talking about in this episode, it forces you to do these things, which helps you grow, which helps you develop as a clinician, and which ultimately helps you get better, not just for this patient, but every patient thereafter. Hands down, writing a case report is absolutely what set me on the path to becoming the specialist and emerging expert in OncoPT that I am today. And I believe with every fiber of my being that you have a case report like this inside you. You have a powerful case report that is going to catapult patient care for all people diagnosed with cancer. You have a case report inside you that is going to teach and challenge and make other PTs grow into the best possible versions of themselves so that they can show up better for their own patients. Because I know, and you know this too, that cancer does not just affect one person. It affects that person, that family unit, that household, that neighborhood, that entire community. And so when we're able to have these really focused, intentional interactions that we know are actually going to help this patient, it doesn't just help that patient gets better. It helps their family unit, their household, their neighborhood, their entire community get better. And that's why we're doing this in OncoPT, right? That's why we're doing all of this. So if you have been inspired, if you are feeling compelled to write a case report, if you know, at least I know I have to write my case report, okay? I know I have to do it. It's on the plan. Here's what I want you to do. I have a free brand new masterclass called the three-step framework for a finished case report. It is my free masterclass. It is brand new. It is just what you need to help you not only start but also finish your case report with a proven plan. And you can find that free masterclass at the oncopt.com slash framework. You're going to love it. And I can't wait to read your case report. And I cannot wait to see what becomes of you on the other side of that case report. So until next time, this is Elise with the OncoPT. And remember, you are exactly the physical therapist that your patients with cancer need. So let's get to work. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Onco PT Podcast. If you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, leave a rating and review, or support us on Patreon.